Combining two themes of our Jerry episodes on today's episode of the Shannon Ing podcast, his love of films and also his ability to analyze the New York Mets. It starts right now. Welcome to the show, everybody. It's Doug Williams and Jerry Blevins with you on this episode. A reminder to subscribe to the Shane Inning Podcast, Apple, Spotify, wherever you're listening. We appreciate it. And Shane Inning is brought to you by Verizon. It's 5G built right for the Mets from the network. More people rely on only on Verizon. Jerry was on uh, Baseball Night in New York this week, said some interesting things about Bob Melvin. Uh, and you can catch Jerry on Baseball Night in New York occasionally. You can catch me uh, almost every night uh, on the show weeknights, 6 o'clock on SNY. Uh, so I'd like to formally welcome our listeners to the Shay Anything Oscars. Now, I will go ahead and list a bunch of categories for the next, I don't know, however long this is going to take. And uh, until the music plays us off, we will talk about some interesting categories as it pertains to the New York Mets and their 2021 season. So this is a different way, Jerry, of recapping what was an incredibly disappointing and just all around... Uh, in some ways, disastrous season for the New York Mets, but making it a little bit fun. Are you ready? That's the, that's the key. We wanted to have fun here. Um, it was a disappointing season, but there were highlights. There was drama. There was epic you know, performances. There was all sorts of things. And this is a fun way to kind of bring it all together. Perfect theme. Shout out to our producer extraordinaire, you know, Jeff Golden, for the theme. Uh, yeah. Wonderful. I'm excited. Yep, Jeff did a great job. Uh, these categories are fun. He, I'll, 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 I'll mention it when we get to this category, but he started with one, and he thought that one category was so good. I have to create a bunch of other ones. Like it, <laughs> it, it wasn't like he he came up with all of them at the same time. He's like, I have something so brilliant that I, I really have to uh, do something more. That's okay. like uh, any any big idea. It starts with a, a spark, and, it, and then you That's create true. this amazing, you know, forge. And Jeff, that is, you that nailed it. Very buddy. true. He, he he's just <laughs> nothing if not creative. That Jeff. Okay, so our first topic: best costume design. Um, the nominees are the Donnie Stevenson T-shirt, Kevin Pillar's face mask, the black jerseys, or Team Lifeguard Day. Jerry, the award goes to. For me, you know, there was a, these are, this is a strong category for me. There's, there's two big front favorites, you know, the, the, the rookie dress up for team lifeguard was good. A great theme. I'm a big fan. Donnie Stevenson was a little bit too cheesy for my likes, but it, 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 it created a lot of buzz. Everybody was wondering who he was, but for me, it comes down to the, I guess the reemergence of black Friday, you know, the black jerseys at home. And the Kevin Pillar face mask, the 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 black face mask that made him look tough. Um, I feel like for me, I'm my vote is for Kevin Pillar's face mask. I'm not a big fan of the black jerseys. I know I'm in the minority. This is kind of my dark horse pick or the dark knight pick. Uh, but I'm a big Pillar fan here with that because he just looked tough. I like the dark knight, dark horse, uh, because he did look like Batman. Um, you know what? I, I'm going with the black jerseys. Uh, I like the way they look. I know that they resulted in lots of losses for the Mets this year. I'm not superstitious in that way. Uh, I think uh, that was totally coincidental. Uh, and I think generally, uh, I know that Mets fans want to leave this year behind and pretend like it didn't happen, but uh, I'm happy to have the nostalgia that comes with them. And I think they're a good look. And I think when the team is, really winning, which I do think will happen soon. I've been saying that for a long time, but I do think Friday nights at City Field will be really fun because of them. You um, our gonna, next, you think they're going to keep it like that? The the Black Friday theme? Is that I think they should. I think so, too. I like the concept of Black Friday. Yeah, yeah oh. I mean, like, Friday night Knicks is a fun thing in the town. Like, it, it's it's a tradition, and and maybe it's a reason why you go to that pulp, that that night at the ballpark and it adds a different dynamic. I wanted to ask Jeff, like, how, how are we going to pick winners? Like we just decide who we think wins. And then Jeff, yeah. do you, are you coming in no. to be like the, the, uh, the gavel? No, there's no, okay. there's no judge and jury here. It's, it's okay. just us. Uh, just I us also, talking. 
I also wanted to to apologize to the Mets analytics frontman Ben Zosmer, who has a whole side gig where he, he's a published author and predicting Oscars. He has a whole a whole thing like that's a that's his like secret identity, I think. But he's he's running the the analytics department for the Mets. Uh, and we didn't give him the categories ahead of time, so he couldn't predict them. So I wanted to, to apologize to, to, to Ben Zosmer. We didn't give him a, you think he's, any, you think he's listening. Oh, he's yeah, he's tuned in. OK. No, for those. Yeah, yeah for those at home, that's a podcast shake of the head. OK, our next category is the one that created the foundation of this entire segment. Jeff thought of it and was like, this is so brilliant. I need to surround <laughs> it with, I need to surround it with some other mediocre ideas because this one is so brilliant. Um, best supporting ER or ILR. Is it Kevin Pillar or Jonathan VR? This is, this is again, Jeff, fantastic. On paper, if we could pop up, you know, a category, best supporting ILR. Uh, but I'm going to do, I'm going to go with the, the, the Latin pronunciation. I'm going to go with ER. And for me, my vote is Jonathan VR, because I think he was part of the bench mob. He came through, he became a staple, almost the outside of Pete Alonzo. I think he was the steady presence in that Mets lineup. He solidified the infield. He played everywhere. Uh, so I got to go with, with my man, maybe the, the, the second best signing that the Mets had in the off season. Uh, in, in Jonathan VR. Yeah, this is, this is kind of a, a no brainer. Um, Jonathan VR wins this category. He wins the Oscar. Um, look, he got more playing time than I think anybody expected. And at a certain point, it wasn't even because of the injuries. It was because they needed his, uh, you know, his ability to steal bases, his base running. He was fairly consistent defensively. He gave you some pop. He just, showed up and was as consistent as any of the position players were last year for the Mets. So um, Pilar had some moments and certainly it seemed like he was a good clubhouse presence, but um, in terms of being consistently in the lineup and uh, being somebody who was productive, I think VR was above and beyond what we all expected when they made that signing. And I think it was a signing that many Mets fans were skeptical of, and he ended up basically taking JD Davis's job away. Yeah, I think that's I think that that was the big key. I think Pilar, outside of the injury, remained a supporting role. Right. Uh, and where VR stepped in and he was, you know, he was a feature. He was on the matinee. Right. The category was best supporting ER. But, um, you know, this is like one of those supporting actors who, you know, this is, is basically the lead. But there there might be one more other lead with slightly like a more co, lines. A co-lead. You right. Know, they just yeah, got this, bumped down. Right. This is like um leisure winning for Dark Knight. Like that's a good you one. Know, he's not the lead because he's not Batman, but he was kind of the highlight of the movie. Like I think um did for Godfather 2, I'm pretty sure that De Niro won for best supporting actor, even though he was like a co-main actor. I, I yeah, I I'm not sure about that. Well, yeah, but I, I think that makes sense, though, because Godfather 2, you know, De Niro's obviously only in the in the flashback scenes. But he yeah. so like he deserved think, that Oscar, obviously. Screen was, time, though, I think he equals screen time, yeah. Al Pacino, you know, it's supporting, but he's he's he shares the role. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's, he's, he's screen time is is key, I think, in supporting. But best team animal. Is it <laughs> squirrel? Jeff McNeil, rat, raccoon, or the home run horse? The rat, raccoon are they? Are they together? Or are they separate? I, either well, way, we're supposed to think it was one or the other in the, <laughs> in the tunnel. That's true. <laughs> you you know? and I could debate or have a heated yeah. argument or fight whatever you want to do or whatever yeah. happens. Um, but I gotta go. I gotta go with with the home run horse here. It was a positive. Um, it was one of those things that that flashed another little moment in in Mets seasons like storytelling. The, this home run horse that made an appearance started showing up in the dugout, trying to create a little spark, a little bit of um, fandom. So I got to give it to the home run horse. Okay, uh, I'm going to agree. Um, this is one of those categories where 
I'm kind of none of, none of the above, honestly. <laughs> That's fair. Um, and I'm not trying to poo-poo the segment, Jeff. But, you know, Jeff McNeil being the squirrel didn't have a great year. The Rat Raccoon controversy was a little much for me. The Home Run Horse actually also a little much for me. And sure. to a lot of the, the conversation that we had on this very podcast on Tuesday, I thought the Mets were a little over the top with all of the hijinks this year. Um, but I have to give it to somebody. So, well, you know what? I'm going to change my answer and I'm going to give it to squirrel because his dog is really cute. Uh, Hey, uh, Willow McNeil is a, a treasure. I I agree with that. You should all follow Willow Willow on Instagram because it is a a good follow. Yeah. Um, I recommend. I like that. Um, Some people, some people win the NCAA brackets by choosing you know, uniform colors or favorite yeah. mascots. So there's no reason why this set of Oscars could be chosen anyway. By the way, I agree with you with the the cheesy Donnie Stevenson home run horse. Like it's not really my cup of tea, but um, you know, yeah. it's a long season, man. You got to do something. I get it. Yeah. You would know better than I would. Um, best dramatic performance is our mm-hmm. next category. Here are the nominees. Uh, Lindor's three-run homer game against the – or three-home run game, I should say, against the Yankees. Michael Conforto's hit-by-pitch during the home opener walk-off. Patrick Mazika's ground ball walk-off fielder's choices. Uh, Sandy Alderson looking for Javi Baez's earring on the field with the support staff and seemingly everybody in the front office. Uh, And then Baez's thumbs-down press conference. What would you say was the best dramatic performance? So for me, like the, the, the dark horse here is Patrick Mazika's dramatic, you know, walk off ground balls, uh, infield, you know, fielders choices because they were full of drama. You got this big moment, you get a big swing and then you get like a little squibber that actually wins it. Um, then you have Michael Conforto, you know, the hit by pitch where he leans out over and bases loaded to get a walk off, you know, home opener. That was controversial, very dramatic. Um, but for me, the biggest drama maybe all season was the Mets thumb down. You know, I, I guess firsthand getting to see it, this, the bias controversy. I, I don't often, basically hardly ever watch the post game like as live because, you know, I've, it's old, I'm old man. I got to go to sleep, but I was watching this live and I just remember going, what are you doing? Why are you saying this out loud? Like that's, that's not necessary. He was creating drama on top of it. I just remember that being overwhelming. Um, It was definitely, I knew it was going to be fodder. I knew for the team, it wasn't as big as he was making it and it would have been glossed over, but for the, that brief, you know, little bit, it was like everything, everything. I remember John Heyman saying like, get this guy out of town immediately. There was uproar, you know, 98% of people were in, immediately had the, the picket fence and the torches and there was an angry mob. Uh, and then it died down. Like I knew it would because baseball is baseball, and, you know, on to the next day, but for best dramatic performance, that's gotta be, gotta be the thumbs down for me. Um, I'm going to go with the Lindor three homer game against the Yankees. Uh, and I'm trying to picture like, what could be, and we'll get to dramatic score uh, later on in our in our uh, categories, but you know, I can just picture a really dramatic soundtrack to Lindor having this tough season. Everything has gone wrong for him seemingly, and he's facing the Yankees at home, and he comes up clutch. But it's not just the home runs; it's the yapping to Giancarlo Stanton. It's galvanizing this crowd at City Field who has had so little to cheer for this year. To me, that was such a turn in the way that he was perceived by a fan base. Um, but again, this makes you realize, and I, and I said at the top that, you know, this was such a tough season for the Mets and their fans, but these are all great options. Patrick Mazika would make a great character in a movie because, you know, he's not even really supposed to be there as the big league backup catcher. And for him to get these walk-offs in such a unique fashion, that could be a movie. Um, Sandy Alderson looking for a, a diamond earring. Uh, like, again, treasure hunt, like a it. national treasure search. You can't script any of it. So, uh, you know, it's um, 
it's fascinating. I love you, it. You you convinced me. I think I'm gonna switch to the Lindor three homer game. Like wow. after revisiting because of the the John Carlo jaw back and forth, the the arc of Lindor season, that moment in both of the Mets and Yankees seasons felt like it kind of turned a point because we were still within striking distance there. The Yankees were kind of falling off and needed that. And we dominated. And that was like the big cap um, to win that, that series. And for a moment you were, you were begging all season for the signature Lindor moment to start to spark his Mets career. And for me, this is the big one. You're right. I, I, I changed my vote. And by the way, a good director would take that game and go directly to the Yankees losing at Fenway Park in the wild card game. The Mets played a role in the Yankees playing the wild card game on the road. So, Met fans, I know you're disappointed, but you might have helped end the Yankees season. Silver linings, silver linings. There you go. Um, okay, next topic best hairstyling. Is it Francisco Lindor, Marcus Stroman, Noah Syndergaard, Robert Kesselman, Jonathan VR, or Jerry Blevins? I, I got to pull myself out. I can't be. I can't be involved. I was uh, just a just a spring training, and then the first month in the minor leagues, I I, I am disqualified. <laughs> um, but also for me, it would have been Gazelman. He's he's got the glorious locks, the thick, luscious, you know, luscious dark hair. Um, but he wasn't, you know, with the injury. I think he he doesn't kind of qualify. He might have been like best best hair in a limited series kind of approach to it. Um, same with Syndergaard, but I gotta go, I gotta go with Stroman here. I think it was like the, the post game clips of him making sure his hair looks good. You know, in he the, always, he was or, always organizing it during like Steve Gelb's first question. Get it, ready. <laughs> it looks good too. I love the, I love the, the, the dread, uh, with the blonde hair. I think it looks incredible. Um, so I, I gotta give it to Stroman there. Big victory. I, I got to give it to you. Um, and look, I'm not just saying that. I'll be honest. Um, I, I, I don't pay attention to these things much. Um, I don't really know what Lindor did with his hair during the season. Uh, Stroman I know of because I'm familiar with what you're talking about. Syndergaard's hair is old news. It's been the same for a long time now. Gastelman, I have no idea what his hair looks like because I can't remember the last time he pitched other than when he was activated for like the last game of the season. VR, no idea what his hair looks like. Your hair, Jerry, is gold, Jerry. It's gold. It's gold. It is when when you decide to put it all out there for an episode of this podcast, people are saying on Twitter, look at those locks. Plus, you know, you were in uniform this calendar year. You belong in this group. And to me, you have the best head of hair of them all. This would be uh, uh this would be, I'm so honored, such a good category, except I'm speech. honored to be I, with I'm unprepared. Nominees. I didn't write a I didn't write a speech. I didn't think it was possible. That would have been this moment. I'm honored. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Doug. For a guy with okay. glorious hair, uh, that's a compliment. Oh, thank you. Um, best visual effects, our next category is it Jacob deGrom's pitches, the WWE belt, or Aaron Loop's Bush Light can. I mean, DeGrom is, he's going to win almost anything that he's in a category for. Um, his pitches are incredible. It's, it's, it's like, I feel sad because I didn't get to see it as often as I wanted just to, to just to see what he's capable of doing. Um, Cause he's just on a different level. But for me, I got to give it to my, my boy loop, Aaron loops, Bush light cans right there. Just the gusto, the confidence it takes to be like, all right, I, I'm drinking a bush light. I'm going to set it right here, and you're gonna you're gonna watch it, and you're gonna look at it, and it's gonna be a thing. I would never have the guts to put that there. I just wouldn't do it. And that is he he. It's nothing fake. There's no BS about him. He had a historically incredible season, and if we can't get that man in the postseason, at least we could give him this award. I agree with you 100%. Um, I also liked his honest quote in that ESPN article yesterday about the lack of leadership in their clubhouse. That gave me even more respect for Aaron Loop than I already I had. I haven't read it. I got to take a look at that. Yeah, you should check it out. It's a fun article, but it's also got some real Good for interesting him. quotes in there. I love um, it, man. I love it. Don't pull any punches. Be honest. You're yeah. not throwing anyone under the bus, but you're 
you're speaking the truth, man. And that's, again, New York appreciates somebody that's, that's able to stand there and tell the truth. And, and that's all you want. You want somebody that's accountable and doesn't try to blow smoke in people's faces. You know, they don't, they don't want that. So they also appreciate an ERA under one. That helps. Um, that that helps. Part helps. Yeah, um, that does help. You're listening to the Shea Anything Oscars. Uh, they're brought to you by Verizon. It's 5G built right for the Mets from the network. More people rely on only on Verizon. Jeff liked that one that I- That was I a great transition. Sponsorship. Um, okay, we got more categories, folks. Best sound effects editing. Is it Keith talking to Haji on air? Is it Keith's <laughs> iPad going off on air? Is it Keith notification going off on air? Is it Haji meowing on air? I, I, I mean, these are, this is a win-win on all these categories. It's gotta be Haji meowing during the Shea anything. I think it, <laughs> you don't often get the sound effects and, and for that to come together, you know, Haji's a winner in my eyes, uh, 100% of the time. I just started watching the, um, the once upon a time in Queens 30 for 30 mm-hmm. and Haji makes an appearance. And oh, yeah. the first thing that popped in my head was hearing him purr on Shea anything, which is hilarious. So I'm, I'm, I'm voting for the Shea anything, which is, you know, I'm a company man. So, so let's do the Haji. Yeah. I think, uh, I think that's the winner too, Jerry. Um, and I think when you're listening to Keith, you know, speak seriously about the New York Mets and you just hear like, in the, in the background, (laughs) it is jarring, but it's, it's just like it's the Keith Hernandez experience. You're not going to get that with anybody else. It's unique, nope. and um, I would love for Keith to accept an award one day up on stage with Haji uh, draped over his shoulder, who is now 18 years old, by the way. Free to wow, uh, that's incredible. Free to vote. Free to uh, join our military. Uh, officially an adult, so good for Haji. Um, I'll, I'll get him a cigar and and let him yeah go to war. That's um. The- Okay, I teased it earlier. <laughs> Best original score. Um, now, score being a double meaning here. Well, not a double meaning. It has one meaning, but it's the opposite of the meaning that you're expecting. It's literally a run scoring instead of music. Uh, Baez walk off. Um, VR slide under the horrible Gary Sanchez tag. Tommy Hunter's run after his first big league hit. Man, these this there's only two, you know the the VR slide under Gary Sanchez. Um, for me, for me, that's the that's a Gary Sanchez thing. That's a terrible terrible play on him. That doesn't have anything to do with us in the mo- most part. So it's a two horse race for me. You've got my man Tommy Hunter's first run, like that's incredible. That that huge human being, the happiest human on, on the face of the planet after he got his knock, like literally the happiest moment. It's 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 wonderful. Um, and then him making it all the way around. I, it's hard for me to go against that, but I got to go with the Baez slide into home in, in Miami. It was one of those magic moments and we were looking for, for Baez who had an amazing run as a Met. He really, he really elevated his status amongst the free agents coming here. Um, he elevated his game, but he still remained El Mago and, and that slide to where he kind of snuck around he ran through a stop sign and he just he just made magic happen so i got to give it to Baez walk off and a big shout out to tommy hunter out there love that man you know what's interesting jeff just shake your head or not were did you when you put in Baez walk off score did you mean the earring one or the miami one actually that's not a yes or no question so i'm going to need you to use your microphone and chime in earring yeah oh that but by the way Jerry, you did nothing wrong. Upset and upset. And that is that is a testament to the fascination around Javi Baez. Two, <laughs> two slides in the home plate that were so dramatic that they're Oscar worthy. The one in Miami was typical Javi Baez magician with his hands in a slide. And then the one at City Field where he cut third base so well and the Mets have that improbable walk off and he loses the earring. That's what Jeff intended, but I think you took it in a, a cool, interesting direction. I, I, I like both of those actually. That that slide, yeah. it was it was okay. wasn't that the post uh, thumbs down back yes. to New York game? So yeah. that there was drama mixed in, but I still like. I still think that was a signature slide in Miami. So my vote stays the same. But that was another addition to the category. Yeah, 
Um, I think that's the one I was going to go with. Uh, I'm going with the the, the, the slide loses the earring. Yeah, because I ended up, I don't know if anyone knows this, but it, not a big deal, but I ended up finding the earring. Uh, I went back, um, not physically. I, I didn't ever physically find it or else, you know, I would have probably um, retired on a, a nice, yeah, exactly. A nice, kind, a kind person would have given it back to Javi. I would have probably like gone directly to a pawn shop. But having said that, I didn't find it physically. I went back and I looked at the video and I tracked the little diamond falling out of the sky. And we did it as a segment on Baseball Night in New York. So that's just that. the, that is what I went that's to wonderful. college did they, for. Did they find it and he he get it? Everything was fine? No, I don't think he ever found it. Oh, the grounds crew? They said, we don't get a playoff share this year. We're going to go ahead and split this the up. The ground screw, I bet what happened was the ground screw was looking for it. And they're like, no, and like no one found it. And then they're like, did you hear, uh, did your mic quit last week? They're like, oh, yeah, he didn't give it, he didn't, he didn't give any reasoning. He just decided it out of the blue. I thought he loved this job. Yeah. He just quit. And he, he's, he he's, driving, it, he a, he's driving a Jaguar suddenly. <laughs> he didn't say quit. He said retired. He took the ball player, you know. <laughs> You know, he, he used it. Good for him. Good for Mike. Shout out yeah. to Mike's new Shout out Mike. house in, in the Gulf Coast. Javi Bias doesn't need the earring as much as Mike does. Javi Bias is about to make like nine figures and a new contract. He'll be good. Um, be okay, great. so Je- Jeff's final two. One category wasn't enough, I guess. The best original song, the categories are Back Wait, in Black. Yeah. Let's let's talk about both of them. Like, okay, talk about both categories. That way we can, one. The we can... second category is you'll see. Hang on. Best original song, Back in Black by ACDC. Give it away, Red Hot Chili Peppers. Uh, Brutal by Olivia Rodrigo. Bye 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 by NSYNC. And then best original song, the All Green Day category. Wake me up when September ends. Good riddance. Basket case. Boulevard of broken dreams. Nice guys finish last. Give me Nova Kane. These are two wonderful categories. You know, best original song, best original, you know, Green Day song. They, they're all encompassing. Let's go with, with songs. So you got the back and black with the black jerseys. Would have been a cool story. Um, give it away. Very fitting. My favorite Chili Pepper song. Uh, brutal. And then for me, the winner is NSYNC's Bye Bye Bye. Um, I'm not going to do the dance. I'm not going to do... I, I can. It's in there. Um, I should let my curls go a little, you know, early 2000s uh, JT. But uh, yeah, bye, bye, bye. G- good riddance to this season. Let it go. Um, we're on our way. Wow. Um, I <laughs> There's so many to choose from. Mm. Um, you know what? Um, I'm going to go with give it away. Um, I, I, uh, I like that song, but it's more about the fact that the Mets were in first place for so long. And, you know, I thought it was interesting that Sandy Alderson in kind of his end of season press conference talked about that as if it was a good thing. Like, you know, this was a team that was capable of being in first place for months of the season. And I'm like, yeah, uh, when the rest of the division was letting you off the hook. And then when, you know, the season started to really get going, the you know the roster showed its true colors and being kind of built around a fallacy um but i think that's really what the mets did they gave it away and and i will say that a lot of it you know wasn't on them because jacob de got hurt and um that should end up being one of the two themes of this year which was de got hurt and the position players um didn't show up and I think, uh, well, they showed up. I know they're they're trying and the efforts there, uh, but it's just I, I they weren't it. they weren't who we thought they were. Yeah, yeah, I think that's I think that's the biggest thing that the they gave it away. I, I, I like that. I'm still sticking with bye 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 because you know turn the page, move on. But yeah. for the theme of the season, they they gave it away. They tried the rest of the division tried to give it to them, and they said no thanks. Right. Um, all right, that's that's gonna do it for our Oscar and our nominees. We're we gonna do the, the Green Day version. Oh, you wanna I thought you wanted to pick them all together. Oh, okay. Did it did you did you pick I'm gonna yeah, let's do I'm gonna do the Green Day best original. So we got Wake Me Up When September ends, which is very fitting, kind of bye bye bye. Good riddance, basket case, boulevard of broken dreams, nice guys finish last and give me Novocaine. I gotta be Boulevard of Broken Dreams because I, I felt the dream for this team. I felt it. I came out of 
you know, semi-retirement to try to be a part of it. Um, and it just, it just fell apart. It was like this, all this hope, all these, all these dreams just shattered. So I, I got to give, even though basket case is very fitting, um, I got to go with Boulevard of Broken Dreams. I'm going to go with good riddance in this category because I feel like um, what uh, one of the points that we've been making on the podcast over and over again is that 2019 and the way that season ended gave maybe Mets fans and maybe some in the front office false hope that, you know, they didn't have to build on this uh, any more than, look, this is a good core, add a couple pieces and we'll be winners. And I think that this year finally showed that the Mets need to mix things up. They need to bring some, some new position players in to join Jacob deGrom, to join Francisco Lindor. Um, I don't think anybody, you know, when I say that they didn't think they had to add to the group, I mean, they signed Francisco Lindor to $341 million contract. So that's a little unfair, but I just think that like, good, this year uh, was maybe the failure that the team and the franchise needed in order to grow. And sometimes you need that. 2019, like the team didn't make the postseason, but for some reason we felt good about it. 2020, shortened season, whatever. Can't read too much into it. This season, I know it was disappointing, but I do feel like Steve Cohen, Sandy Alderson on down, everybody will learn and grow from it. And I think they have a better chance to compete next year. Um, okay, now that our uh, awards have been given out, Jerry, uh, you, you've added a new wrinkle to our kind of off-season rain delay recommendation because there won't be any rain delays uh, in the off season. So what about uh, a snowstorm recommendation? It's either a movie franchise or a multi-season show. So what'd you decide to go with? Yeah, we, we switched things up. Uh, so the, it's basically anything that has at least a trilogy or more moving on uh, tons to choose from, but for me, I'm going to start it where everything started for me as far as franchises go. Um, and it starts with Christopher Nolan for me, the great Christopher Nolan, who started out in, you know, with with movies like Insomnia, Memento in 2000 and just blew my mind. I'm like, what did I see? I had to go back and rewatch The Prestige, which is I think is super underrated as a film. Um, but it started everything started the Marvel Cinematic Universe, all these movies uh, with 2005's Batman Begins. It was the first really deep dive, gritty, granular, almost like set in real world in a, in a weird sense, uh, take on superheroes. And that started everything. You, you saw Iron Man kind of take the exact same thing and run with it. But The Dark Knight was different. Uh, you had an amazing actor in, in Christian Bale at the lead, and he, he did wonderful things in that movie. It became The Dark Knight in 2005. Then he followed up in 2008 with, or The Batman Begins in five. The Dark Knight in 2008 had one of the greatest villain performances in Heath Ledger um, being the Joker. It was unbelievable. That was like, I remember seeing that in theaters. I sat IMAX, like front row, and the introduction was insane and I hated everything about it. And then when the Joker comes onto screen, and he puts like the pencil and he's like, I'm going to make this disappear. And then he slams the guy's head into it. Spoilers. Uh, I was just like, whoa, what is this? Um, fantastic. And then it finishes up in 2012 with The Dark Knight Rises. A lot of this build up. Um, and it didn't disappoint. It was incredible. So many amazing, cool Batman gadgets, which I'm all, which I'm all for. It's kind of the same thing I love in Bond, which is, you know, possibly coming up. Um, but it's 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 got everything it's got great performance it's got great direction it's got some a good storyline epic explosions and it started you know for good or bad the whole thing about just rebooting all this from the spider-mans all the marvel stuff all the dc stuff that's coming through uh for me started with batman begins i mean uh i love uh, all three movies in that trilogy i've seen them all countless times um and i think it's a great uh, snowstorm recommendation to anyone who hasn't, you know, maybe bought into any superhero stuff because in some ways that's me. I'm not a big Marvel universe fan, um, but I'm a huge Christopher Nolan fan. So, um, and honestly uh, my fandom with him started with Batman begins a dark Knight, And then it went backwards uh, you know, inception. I loved when I was in college and then I went back and prestige and memento 
been a fan ever since. So um, great recommendation. Jerry. He's truly like anything Christopher Nolan puts out. I don't care what it is, what it's about. I'm seeing it and I'm seeing it as soon as I humanly possible. And it was Batman Begins was it for me because I, I saw Memento and Insomnia and the Prestige. I'm like, these are really good, well thought out. That's that's good. This, this guy might have something. And then Batman Begins and just blew my mind. I'm like, ah, I'm signing up for anything that Christopher Nolan brings to the table. All right. Um, uh, two thoughts on two topics, Jerry, before we let you go. And this right. is really the, um, you know, the, the thing on the mind of most Mets fans right now uh, is the state of their manager. Now, as we've been recording this, uh, our colleague Andy Martino reported that there's some uh, news with the Mets coaching staff. We already know, I'm sure you know by now, if you're listening, that, that Louis Rojas won't be back. But Dave Joust, Ricky Bonus, uh, Gary DeSarcina, Jeremy Accardo, Tony Tarasco, and Brian Schneider are all free to seek other jobs. Uh, hitting coaches reassigned to the minor leagues. So Hugh Quattlebaum is now back to being in the minor leagues. Uh, pitching coach Jeremy Hafner expected to remain the organization. The Mets hold a, an option on his contract. So that's that's what we know about the Mets coaching staff. But the big one, Jerry, is Louis Rojas. Um, so what did you think of that move a couple of days removed? And um, what do you think is necessary in his replacement? Yeah, I, I feel like it was it was the right thing to do. You know, the, the guy was, he's a great baseball mind, a, a, a great human being. Um, but the results weren't there. You know, they, he had, he got handed the the keys to a, to a, a tough car, like something that wouldn't start the 2020 season. It, it was so strange. That was his first foray into it. He filled in for Carlos Beltran who went down dramatically in very Metsy fashion. Um, and then 2021, you have these great expectations and it just didn't work out. And you need a fall guy. You need people to clean house. And for me, the biggest part of it is uh, there's two, two parts. One, you're filling in your front office, which is the number one priority before you do anything else. And they're going to want to put in their guys who want to, to teach. They want philosophies. They want the, the pecking order to remain, you know, their people. And so that was big. Unfortunately, you're losing as a Mets organization, a, a great developer of talent and a great baseball mind in, in Louis Rojas. I hope he I hope for his sake, he got a taste of being a manager. If he wants to do that again, he's going to have to move on to a different organization. But if he doesn't want to be at that level again, you know, maybe he maybe he stays within the organization, becomes a, uh, a bench coach and works his way back up eventually. I don't know, but I do know that if he chooses to leave, the Mets are going to be shorthanded because he he really is a, a good baseball mind. So I wish the best to him. Um, it was it was a necessary move. He he talked about it. He handled it like he did everything with grace. Said, look, the results weren't there. I understand this is a results based, you know, job. So he he took it. Um, it stinks, but it is what it is. Jerry um, said some things about Bob Melvin uh, on Baseball Night New York earlier this week that uh, was tweeted out by SNY. You should check it out if you haven't already. Jerry is a big fan of his. And, and speaking of Oakland, Jerry, um, you mentioned that they need to hire someone in the front office. The Mets are actively looking for a president of baseball operations to hire a manager. And they need to get this process going because, uh, you know, they want to know uh, who's making the decisions sooner rather than later. David Stearns is one of the names. They can't talk to him yet because the Brewers are in the playoffs. Theo Epstein, uh, Andy was the first to report, not a fit with the Mets. Uh, he and Steve Cohen chatted. That's not happening. What would you think about Billy Bean doing what he's done, given that you played in Oakland with, with so little uh, room to maneuver from a salary perspective, uh, to Steve Cohen playing with his money in this market as compared to Oakland. What do you think? I, I think it would be an incredible get. I think the, one of the, one of the many things that I admire about Billy Bean is he, he, he surrounds himself with the smartest people he can with people that he thinks are great baseball minds. He's done it. You know, David Forst is over there doing a great job as their GM. He was an assistant GM when I was there. Farhan Zahidi kind of, we came up together in that Oakland organization. You see what he did in LA. Now he's doing it in San Francisco. You look at that roster, that coaching staff, and you're like, 
How are they winning? Well, it starts for me with Farhan. And then he's done the same thing. It's surround himself with people that he thinks are the smartest people he can. And Billy's done that. He has no ego when it comes to this guy knows this more than me. This guy does this better than me. And he brings them all in and lets them do their thing. And he is the, the guiding point towards a goal. And he keeps all those brilliant minds focused on, on that, that theme. And then he lets them do their job. And it, it's incredible. If the Mets can get him, I think they should 100% go for it. I don't know how that works, him having an ownership stake. I don't know all the, the, ma the machinations of, of what you would need to do. I do know that Bob Melvin is gettable. He's got a contract. You could trade for him. Um, and I think they should 100% go for at least Melvin. But if they can get the combination as a package deal, that's a win for the organization because that solidifies everything. You're, you're talking about that steady force. You're going to get a manager that's going to be there for a while, and you're going to get the, the president of baseball ops in some role that can – move forward and just says, look, this is where I'm, I'm laying my claim. I'm, I'm planting my flag and we're going to write this ship. We're going to move on. I think it's a great job. So there's a lot of people that would want this. And if you can get them, get them. And if you can imagine being Steve Cohen, which is hard, I mean, he's obviously been a savvy businessman for a long time and that's how he's become the owner of the Mets. Is there any more appealing equality of somebody to, to put so closely to you underneath you in the organization than somebody who's done a lot with a little, who's yeah. had constraints to maneuver, to, you know, uh, basically find a way to win without having to ask ownership for massive contracts, to trade players when it hurts to trade them because you know they're talented, but they'll never resign with you. If I'm Steve Cohen, that is so appealing because you will know that your president of baseball ops has the ability to maneuver without coming to you and saying, Hey, I need to sign this player to a $200 million contract. Um, and, and even though you have the ability to do that, you want, and to say, yes, you want somebody under you who, who doesn't need that to do their job. Um, what a fascinating combination. There's, of there's like so be. many like serendipitous, you know, pieces of this, like, you know, he was drafted by the Mets, a first round pick Billy Bean was mm -hmm. traded away before they won in 86. Like it's just coming home, you know, being and not home. He's a West coast guy, but like coming back to the organization that started him as a professional and doing what he couldn't do as a player for an organization that, that, that drafted him would be, I mean, it's, it's, it's he's already had a movie based on him, but this would be very Hollywood like as well. Maybe yeah, Moneyball, Moneyball show. 2. Maybe it's a Broadway yeah. show. There's a Moneyball 2 sequel. Brad Pitt's just a little bit older. And, you know, he goes to Fenway Park to meet with John Henry and he has that cup of coffee or whatever it is. And that's such a great scene. Mm -hmm. um, and and then, you know, he you could tell he's thinking about it, thinking about it, think about it and decides not to take the job. And now maybe, you know, the scene is him having coffee with Steve Cohen at City Field. And um, I don't know. And by the way, it's not talked about enough. He's going to make a lot of money. This is not um, a just a decision based on what team you want to work for. These high up front office members can make a lot of money in their contracts when they take a job. So Steve Cohen has the ability to say, Hey, I'm going to pay you a lot to do this job. It just, so everyone at home knows the, the figures are, he's going to be fine. It's going to be enticing. The ownership stake. Not that they'll make not it that enticing. It, not that it's, you know, he's, he's done well for himself already. He's got ownership yeah. stake in a, in a ownership stake in a big league ball club, which is, as we know, very lucrative. Um, but that like it would it would it's not a it's not going to be a deciding factor, but it would be, you know, hey, I can, you know, I can line my pockets a little bit while I'm doing right. something I love, which is which is perfect. Right. Go um, get them. That would be so fun. It would be so would. fun. And we could talk about it for do it for us. Do it for Shay anything. Do it I for agree. Doug and I. That would be wonderful. Come on, Steve. Uh, come on, Steve. Go in. I apologize. A reminder to subscribe to Shane Anything, Apple, Spotify, wherever you're listening. We appreciate it. Another reminder that Shane Anything is brought to you by Verizon. It's 5G built right for the Mets from the network. More people rely on only on Verizon. Jerry, thank you. Fun as always. Uh, we'll talk to you soon, my friend. All right. Thank you, Doug. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for listening, everybody. Talk to you next week.